All right. Uh, I'm going to ask Gracie, can you bring me a tissue? This is really a weird request, but I need one, and I didn't bring it. And he's the only one I can know to ask right now. Um, uh, let me r remind one thing. There was a little bit of a confusion on one of the slides. I do the membership class, so I want to remind you that the slide I th said, think, I think it said Thursday, and the date is actually Wednesday. So don't come up on Thursday because nobody will be here but you uh, in terms of that. So please come on Wednesday. And I look forward to that. We have a list of, uh, I forget what the actual number is, but maybe close to 20 people who are moving toward membership, which is so encouraging. And so uh, I look forward to meeting you there uh, to discuss that. Uh, the second thing uh, you'll find in your bulletins today, you'll find a set of notes, not with the little note that I wrote on mine, but you'll find one just like this. I want to encourage you to get it out. Uh, number one, not that the goal of the hour is for you to make sure that you fill in all the blanks, but it is a device for you to help you listen. Um, it's help you uh, uh, follow along with what we're going to be talking about today. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, matter of fact, I just encourage you, whether you bring it in electronic form, your Bible, or you bring a Bible in your hand, which I would encourage you to have. Uh, and I'd encourage you to bring a pen or a pencil. Uh, and what we always try to do, if you've noticed, we try to provide some notes for you to write some things down. I'm pretty confident that you're not going to take away everything that I say today, but I'm confident that God is at work in the preaching of his word, and he has something for you today. And I don't want you to miss it. And also, I don't want it to be one of those things where you hear it while you're sitting here, and when you walk away, you forget it. So the best way to do that is write it down. Now, back on September 6, <clears throat> 1992, <clears throat> the decomposed body of Christer, uh, Christopher McCandless was discovered by moose hunters just outside the northern boundary of Denali National Park. He had died inside a rusting bus that served as a makeshift shelter for trappers, dog mushers, and other backcountry visitors. Taped to the door was a note scrawled on a page torn from a novel. Here's what the note read. Attention possible visitors. S-O-S. I need your help. I am injured, near death, and too weak to hike out of here. I am all alone. This is no joke. In the name of God, please remain to save me. I am out collecting berries close by and shall return this evening. Thank you. Chris McCandless, and then it has the month of August written with a question mark behind it because he didn't know what day it was. From a cryptic diary found among his possessions, it appeared that McCandless had been dead for 19 days. A driver's license issued eight months before he perished indicated that he was 24 years old and weighed 140 pounds. After his body was flown out of the wilderness, an autopsy determined that it weighed 67 pounds and lacked any fat at all. The probable cause of death, according to the coroner's report, was starvation. By his own words, Christopher McCandless wanted to experience life in the wild. One of his uh, biographers, a guy by the name of John Krakauer, he said that uh, McCandless became a hero to so many people because he reminded them of somebody who rejected conformity. He didn't want to go the normal way that everyone else wanted to do, and he rejected materialism. And he wanted to discover what was authentic and what was not. He wanted to test himself and to experience, and here is the words of uh, John Krakauer, the raw throb of life without a safety net. Others, as they've assessed the McCandless's life, they're not so uh, uh, high of an opinion of his little uh, uh, ex uh, adventure. They don't see him as such a romantic figure. Uh, this is one, another adventure seeker puts it this way. Many backpackers are on a search for meaning to their lives, wanting to discover more about themselves and what it means to truly live. Many backpackers have things that they want to forget and leave behind. But Chris's story is just a tragic one. Chris McCandless wanted to know what it was like to live off the land in the wilderness, choosing to go only with 10 pounds of rice, a rifle, and a book on wild plants. He found out what it was like to live in the wilderness, lonely and hard. 
If I was to hazard a guess, the opinion of this author, if I was to hazard a guess, I think Chris McCandless had an arrogant vision of himself as someone who could survive with barely anything but the clothes on his back. He wanted to explore the unexplored and discover a life without responsibility, a life without possessions, a life without people, a life without money. But in doing so, he went to his death. He insisted on going hardcore, but in the end, it was pure stupidity. When things didn't go to plan and he was dying of starvation, he left an SOS note asking for help, but it was too late. Unfortunately, Chris went into the wild looking for answers, but ended up dying because of a lack of preparation, lack of supplies, and lack of common sense. The answer he got was a simple one. Nature will kill you if you're unprepared. So no matter how you look at this young man, and certainly there's much more to the story, it appears that he was certainly not prepared for life in the wild. Certainly was not prepared. Now I want you to think about this in terms of the biblical storyline. For those of you that have read the scriptures, you know how it begins with God's creation of everything, and in particular with his creation of Adam and Eve, the pinnacle of his creation. Now, from the moment Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, it only takes us up to chapter 3, till Adam and Eve decide to go their own way, God removed them from the garden in judgment, but he also removed them in mercy, because instead of destroying them, God set in motion a plan that would operate over the millennia, over the thousands of years that were represented even to today, to restore and reclaim his creation. But since that time, since Genesis uh, 3, humans have lived in the wild. The world that was designed for their blessing and flourishing had now become something very different. God had subjected the world to futility. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. This judgment by God affected every being, everything that lives, and everything, the material world. Although some of its original beauty was and is still evident. It had to be rendered incap it had been now been rendered incapable of reflecting all that God had intended for it to be. It was still a place where the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve could enjoy and survive in, but it was also a place that they would have to battle against to survive. And their joy would always be incomplete and accompanied by things like pain, discontentment, and frustration. And any of us who have lived through 2020 know that to be true. Right, we're sitting around, most of us in here, apart from me because uh, I'm speaking here, with masks on to protect ourselves from some unseen agent that has killed hundreds of thousands of people in the United States of America. And we have known a uh, mixture of joy mixed with pain, frustration, and discontentment. But ultimately, this battle... Now that they're in with the world in which they live, this battle was one they could not win. And the scriptures speak that sin and death are now stalking the land, and they know they're no longer immune to their power. Maybe, if we read in Psalm 90, as the psalmist reflects Moses there, we might live 70 years, or if God gives us strength, 80 years, or by chance we might make it to 100, but death will claim each and every one of us. Sin, something that formerly was not part of Adam and Eve's life, now it's at work in our hearts, encouraging us to walk away from God just as Adam and Eve did. So the biblical storyline addresses this question, how on earth will the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve navigate this new world? How are we going to make it through this new world that is hostile to us and that even within us uh, is our forces at work that are drawing us away from the life that God created for us. Is there any hope of getting back in the garden? How most particularly could their relationship with the God they had rebelled against be righted? How could they get back? Because that's the key thing. It's their rebellion against God that set everything in motion over against them. Or to put it in terms of the story that we read, is there any way to prepare to live this life in the wild so that it won't kill you? So the Bible, then, is the account of what God has done to allow humanity to return to the garden. It's the story of what God has done in history that culminates in its center point in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is God's answer for the mess that we've made in the world. 
And so Jesus came to live the sinless life that he lived, and it's his sinless life that gets credited to our account so that we as rebels can come back into a relationship with a God that we rebelled against. Right? So he dies on our behalf to take the judgment that we deserve and his righteousness that we don't deserve is given to us so that we can stand before a holy God that we had rebelled against. And then he rose from the grave to win for us the life that we had lost to make us his own and set us on a new trajectory. But we know that the way God has worked out his program, that when Jesus came, he didn't culminate his program and say, okay, it's all over. No, he set in motion a program that now through his people, the church, God is going out proclaiming and saying, the king is come. He's made a provision for all of you rebels to come back underneath my benevolent rule. So repent of your rebellion, believe on Jesus Christ and come back under that because when the king returns, there'll be judgment. And so we live in this moment where the way of Jesus is the way to find life, even though we live over against a world that is still broken and fallen. And so until Christ returns, we who follow Christ will experience pain and frustration and difficulty. And barring Christ's return, we will experience the physical effects of the fall. We will die and have to navigate, as the psalmist would say in Psalm 23, the valley of the shadow of death. So how can we live in the wild, this world that's waiting for Christ to come and reclaim it before we ultimately live in the garden again with with God? How do we navigate this life in the wild? How should we live? What's the path, to use the biblical terms, the path of wisdom and life or the path of foolishness and death? Well, over these next two uh, months, we're going to consult a body of literature known as the wisdom literature, and in particular, the book of Proverbs. And we're going to look at God's advice for how to live with skill in the world that leads to life. Now, you'll find, and I should turn this on, you'll find that this is a picture of McCandless, uh, for example, that uh, is here. This bus has now become famous. This is bus 142. Uh, it actually became so famous uh, and almost infamous because people has it in their life to go find it that they've actually now airlifted it and put it in a museum uh, so that people can come there. And the debate is out whether he indeed was a fool or someone who's pointing to the kind of life that we should all live. Uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden and the Book of wisdom literature. Now, here's the issue that I I want you to talk about. These are the types of uh, books that we're referring to, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to work through uh, the book of Proverbs in particular, dealing with some of the topics, to try to get God's wisdom or perspective on how to live our lives in ways that keep us off of the path of stupidity, to use the term of, or the path of a fool uh, in the book of Proverbs. Now, the center point of this, and this is the first thing in your notes here if you want to write it down, for all of the wisdom literature, the only way to make your way through the world that has all of these pitfalls and all of these challenges that could lead you to suffering and death and disappointment and discouragement by virtue of your own choices is to have an appropriate respect or fear for God. This is the starting point and the ending point of a life that is wise. And so uh, uh, here to try to describe what a fear of God is, this is not someone who is afraid to come to God or someone who tries to hide from God because they're afraid of his judgment. This is someone who has the proper perspective on God that comes to him as someone who is worthy of respect and all. Right, one of the things that... uh, Uh, from uh, my early life. Uh, My dad was a hunter, and uh, uh, I enjoyed that with him. And one of the things that he wanted me to have is appropriate respect for firearms. And so uh, I remember him, him, him training me with regards to that, and I mentioned this before. I had to spend a whole year uh, hunting with him, walking out in the field, carrying a BB gun with no BBs in it. So a BB gun, this little BB gun I had that it was bought was one of these little daisy ones. If I was trying to shoot the BB gun at Matt Jobson, who is sitting over here at this table, it would probably bounce twice before it got to him, right? So I'd I'd probably roll to him on the ground. So it was not a threat to anyone unless, of course, I tried to shoot somebody up front, up close. 
but I had to carry this BB gun. I had to carry it exactly the way you were supposed to. Every time I climbed a fence, I had to put it down and, and put it on the ground, then climb the fence, then pull it over in the appropriate way. Anytime my dad saw me not carrying it rightly, like I was pointing it at someone or pointing it over my shoulder, not knowing where the end of the barrel was, I'd get a lecture. I mean, it was, it was a rough uh, hunting season. It wasn't much fun. But well, my dad told me at the beginning, he says, until you learn to respect the potential of that firearm, you cannot carry it. You will not carry it. I'm not hunting with somebody who's going to shoot me. All right? And so he said, until you learn how to carry that thing, you can't do it. And, and what the book of Proverbs is saying, until you get a right vision of God, you're not ready to live life because you're not ready to be teachable. If you don't view God as high and lifted up as the God who created everything, when you think about that, right, when you think about the scriptures, after you get past the book of Genesis, all the rest of the things that God does are like yawners, right? After you create everything from nothing, what's the big deal that you resuscitate a bit of it once in a while, right? When he, God raised Jesus from the dead and he came out, everybody should say, okay, yeah, he's God, right? I'm not surprised about that. The fact that God's going to resurrect all of his people and bring them to him. When Paul says that people struggle with thinking, how could God resurrect all the dead of all times from all places? Well, Paul says the simple answer to that is, is you don't have a big enough vision of God. The problem is not with the issue of resurrection. It's just that your vision of God is too small to realize that the God who created everything can bring it all back together if he wants to. And so to have a reverential awe of God is to see him as high and lifted up as someone that is so wise, so powerful, so in control that you would have to be an idiot to give him advice. You'd have to be stupid to say no to him when he says, you know what, there's a hole right there in the road and you look at it and you go, I don't see a hole, God. I just think I'm going to go ahead and walk in it. And the problem with it is not the whole, it's the idea that you don't believe that the God who's telling you how to live your life really knows what he's talking about. And so a reverential awe as someone who stands before God, as I did when I was younger and I stood before my dad, and I loved my dad, but I feared my dad. I respected him. I didn't want to disappoint him. And when he told me this was the way to go, when I was in my right mind, I said, yes, I will. Yes, sir. Because I want to go in the path that enjoys what you want me to enjoy and keep me out of the dangers that you're trying to keep me out of. And that's exactly the fear of the Lord is the beginning and the end of the life of wisdom. So it starts with someone who said, God, I believe who you are. I've trusted in Jesus as my savior. And now I want him to guide and direct my life. Right? So it begins there. But it also ends there. So as you grow in the life of wisdom, you become more and more adept at following Jesus through the various things that make up everyday life in the fallen world. So this is what you'll see in the book of Proverbs. Notice Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So it's the beginning of wisdom is the knowledge and fear of God. But notice in Proverbs 2, it's the end of wisdom. If you look for wisdom as for silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So it's both the beginning point and the ending point of wisdom. Okay, now let's try to be a little bit more careful and define just what wisdom is, okay? When you're talking about wisdom, what does it mean? And here you can fill in some of your sheet there, if you will, with some scripture verses that are there. Well, in scripture, the word for wisdom is used for at least three different ways of thinking about what wisdom is. One, it's referred to a skilled craftsman. Right? This is where the idea of skill comes in. Somebody who can wield uh, uh, a, a, a tool and produce great works of art has skill, right? So there's a kind of idea about that. This is where you often hear people describe wisdom as a skill in living, right? Or an excellence in living. So you have a skill to make wise choices through various different areas of life, okay? And let me just say this here. Most of the Christian life, most of everyday life, is making choices outside of the things that are very clearly either called for or warned against by God, right? There's a lot of things that God's pretty clear about. So God doesn't want you to steal, right? Don't steal. There's a lot of different ways you can steal. You can steal time from your employer, right? You can steal um, affection from your spouse. 
There's all kinds of things you can steal. You can steal material things, right, from your office or from somebody else in your room or whatever the case may be. You can take something that doesn't belong to you. Well, that's clearly, you don't have to wonder, you know, is it wise to steal or not? Let me think about that. All right, well, there's nothing to ask, to think about. No, don't steal, right? Same way. Um, let's see, should I have an affair on my husband or wife today? Let me think about that. Is that very wise or not? No, God says, no, don't commit adultery. Straightforward, right? But many of the choices that we make in life don't fall under those categories of God's teaching, right? So like, how much money should you have spent at Christmas? Well, I don't, there's no chapter in verse says, or there's no chapter on Christmas, number one, right? Uh, go to Ezekiel chapter five, there's a chapter on Christmas. No, there isn't one. Right? So how much should you have spent? Well, that's, that's a, an issue of wisdom. Well, how much money do you have? What are you spending it on? Are you taking care of your other bills? Right? Uh, do you have obligations that you've already met? Well, that's, that's not a clear decision, and then it's not the same decision for everybody. So you can't come in and say, everybody should spend $10 on Christmas. Why $10? I don't know, because I like $10, and I don't like to buy gifts. Right? Well, that, there's no scripture that says that. Right? How much money? How much money should you spend on your clothes? What kind of car should you drive? Right? How do you use your time throughout the day, every day? How many Netflix binges should you go on? Right? How many? Right? What what constitutes a waste of your time? Which show should you watch? Well, if you're trying to you're trying to sift the show, what criteria do you use to say whether I should let this into my soul or not? What music should I be dancing to? Should I be dancing, right? Right? Whatever, right? Whatever that, whatever the issues are, right? Uh, there, there is no "thus saith the Lord" on those things, right? Even and you'll find these one of these things when something comes out, like tattoos, right? How many tats should I have, and should I have any? What well, is what the scriptures say about it? Not, and the answer is it doesn't say anything directly about it. And the only context that it speaks about marking your skin has to do with it in terms of doing it as a mark of some sort of cult or worship of some other sort of deity. Well, for the vast majority of people that are putting tats on, as far as I understand, that's not what they're doing. So the question is, does it say anything? The answer is no. It doesn't speak to it directly. It does say about alcohol that if you're in leadership, you need to think about it real carefully because of the weight that you have. It says that you cannot be drunk by it. And you shouldn't be under its control, but when exactly do you come under its control? I mean, all of you know that when, when they set these, these, these alcohol uh, limits, right, as far as make, making that you're under the influence, those are kind of arbitrary. They're kind of a, a center point that through research that usually if you have this much alcohol in your bloodstream, it renders you incapable of making judgment. But that's not true for everybody. Some people can be highly functioning alcoholics. Other people, they drink a little bit and they're under the table. And so for you, a much lesser percentage is when, and then what constitutes being drunk? How do you know when you're not really in control of your own faculties, right? Well, Scripture doesn't give you precise things along those lines. It warns you about being under the control of some sort of substance so that you can't submit to the control of the Spirit. But it's an area of wisdom. Another area of wisdom that's driving us crazy right at the moment we, we have all kinds of problems in our broader culture, racial problems, political problems, financial problems, hatred. And there is no biblical definition that says this is the way you go about solving the problem of racism in America. Yet there are Christians who hop on their Instagram in different places and they give prescriptions as if they know exactly what you should do in every circumstances, the word you should say and stuff like that. And I'm saying, where'd you get that from? Because you can't go to scripture and find that there. What you're giving me is your wisdom, as you think it is, that this aligns with the principles of Scripture. I think this is a wise way to go. But instead of them saying, I think this is a wise way to go, they say, thus saith the Lord. And there is no thus saith the Lord about that. Right? So the majority of our lives is lived trying to figure out, given God's heart, given his purposes, given who we are, given what he's up to, how should I wisely spend my stuff? How should I vote in the ballot box? How should I live out my life? How should I eat and drink? All those kinds of things. Well, that's where we're talking about a skill a use in a moral sense for a skill in living. Okay? There's a ton of stuff in the book of Proverbs about how to handle your money. A ton of stuff about how to eat. Okay? Americans, we can think a little bit of how to eat. right? Somebody says, well, I know how to eat. No, I'm talking about how much to eat and how you view your food. 
church has talked about that through the years of, of gluttony, of either being someone of gluttony of excess, eating more and more and more because you're looking to food for some sort of satisfaction, or probably what's more appropriate for us is a gluttony of delicacy. Right? We have to have our food just look just right. It has to be GMO-free, happy cow cheese, you know, everything else that goes on, chickens that love you, chi you know, chicken, right? All those kind of things like that. And the issue is there's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves, but they become things that you can't live, and they become things that you live for. You can't live without, and you live for. Well, where does that cross the line? Right? For the coffee addicts like myself, where does that addiction come after me? Okay? All those kind of things. What, what are those things that God wants you to live a life of freedom, of joy, of purpose, in sync with him? Right? The skill of living. And then finally, it's coming to view all of life as something that God has created, something that God has made possible. And so we live out that life from the perspective of God as creator, God as ruler, and God bringing his things to, to fruition. And so today, for example... Okay, one of the things, one of the principles that comes in, if God is truly the creator and God is ruling and reigning and he's going to bring everything to the goal for which he's made them and that every human being is going to be summed up before him to give account for their life, the only opinion that matters is God's. That's a principle. It matters more than my wife's. It matters more than my kids. It matters more than my neighbor's. It certainly matters more than my Instagram feed. It matters more than my high school peers. And so I want to listen for his voice. And then it comes back into my life. If I believe that God's in control and it's his world, he knows how it functions. He knows how he designed me to function. Well, I want to listen to him and read his word with understanding because I want to figure out who I am and how I should live. I'm going to spend more time doing that than watching the TikTok to tell me what I should do in my marriage. Those are the kinds of things that come from the perspective that it's God's world, you're God's creatures, he made you, and he's also the one that stepped into the world to redeem you and reclaim you, and he's the one that knows how you should live. And that perspective shapes your habits and your perspectives on life. That's wisdom. So the meaning of wisdom. Right. Now, two types within that that we get to see. A practical wisdom, this is what we're more familiar with with the book of Proverbs, and something we kind of call speculative wisdom. The practical wisdom is what we like about the book of Proverbs. Right? This is where they, the, 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 pro, the, pro, the author of the Proverbs, Solomon, is looking, he's observing common patterns of life that Yahweh, God, has embedded in the world. And this wisdom teaches how life typically works. Right? It pays attention to how things typically happen and then draws truths from them to help us to live wisely in the world, right? And so we've got all kinds of Proverbs that have been passed down. God has created the world. And so we're looking, um, it correlates, what it tries to do is it correlates between your choices and your behavior, right? There's certain choices that are going to have certain consequences, all things being equal, okay? If you drink lots of alcohol, you're going to get drunk and do stupid things, okay? That's what life teaches us. You drink lots of alcohol. When you get drunk, you can be a slap happy, you know, happy drunk, or you can be a mean, ugly drunk. Or whatever you're going to be, you're going to be under control of something else than your own mind. Right? What it tells us from Proverbs chapter 5 is that if we don't keep our sexual desires within God's boundaries, they will become a fire that will consume us and rob us of life. That's so why that old phrase that pornography kills love because it distorts it and perverts it. But that's what an age-old observation is. That what happens between men and women when things are distorted, you go down a path of death. So the practical wisdom is after those kinds of things. But it's very clear, and here's something, this is ones that are often abused. It's very clear in Proverbs that these are not rigid formula. It's not if you do A, then B will always occur. Okay? One of the things about Proverbs is they're trying to help us live in a life where God's plans are often mysterious, where things don't often work out the way you would think they would work out. And so it prepares us for the idea that God's ways sometimes are more profound and deeper than our own, and so we don't 
for, think that all of a sudden God's not on the throne because I did the right thing and this right thing didn't turn out. No, God has deeper purposes in mind often of what he's up to and we need to trust him. And so the Proverbs get after those as well, right? So here's some examples of practical wisdom. Sluggards do not plow in season, so at harvest time they look but find nothing. Right? Now there's all kinds of things to think about that. If you're lazy and you don't prepare, right? when it comes time that you can't prepare, you're going to be sitting there starving over the winter time. Now this one, uh, it hits me. I burn a wood stove. Okay? And if I don't cut firewood before October and November, I usually start in October and burn it all the way through to February. If I don't cut enough firewood over a course of that time, then I'm going to run out and my heating bills are going to go up and I might have to go find firewood in a time that I hate to find firewood, like it's cold and snowy or icy or I can't find the resource for it and I'm going to get cold, right? So whatever it is, if you don't work at your job, you're not going to have anything to pay at the grocery store. Right? If you don't put away retirement, and I would encourage you to do that if, if, if you can, right? you're going to be left uh, 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 to our government, which who knows what that's going to turn out to be at the end. Right? So those kind of principles. Another one here. This one gets at the ambiguities. A person's steps are directed by the Lord. How can anyone understand their own way? So the proverbial wisdom says, even though typically if you do A, B will occur, but underneath that, there's a deeper magic at work that God's at work so that you can't conclude that life is just a matter of always doing the right things and then you always get these outcomes. Nope, that doesn't always work that way. And all of us can attest to that. Some of our most frustrating times with God is, God, but I did this. I went to church every Sunday. I did these things. I did that. Why did this happen? But wisdom wants us to be reminded that we shouldn't be knocked on our backsides when we find out that when you're doing the right thing, what you would anticipate doesn't happen. Sometimes you can do all the right things. You can represent Christ well at your job and get fired. Right? So these are the issues. Now, second type is called speculative wisdom. Speculative wisdom, this is where it's digging into when life doesn't turn out the way you thought it should. You've done the right things. And again, Job is our major example of this. So this is where life breaks the pattern normally expected, where the things that happen in a person's life are out of sync with your life's choices. This looks at questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? And we've all e either experienced that directly or we've experienced that in the lives of people. Sometimes I've wondered as you've looked at uh, the Decriegers, and it comes to an example here, missionaries in Togo. Um, the, the dad, just a, a gifted uh, a medical uh, person there, serving the Lord, used by God to start a, a new hospital in Mongo. Wife, Sons, now some of them are attending Cedarville. Just a godly family, love the Lord. He's treating people. I think it was Ebola. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but he's treating people. All of a sudden, he contracts it, and all of a sudden, she's a widow, and four boys don't have a dad, and there he's there. And I'm saying, God, he was such a servant of you. He was so used by you in that place. Why him? Why him? So this type of wisdom is saying, how do we deal with the reversals of life? How do we deal with the disappointments of life? How do we deal when things don't go the way we thought they should, even when we're doing the right things? So it's interesting that the Grayson read from Psalm 73. When he talked about Psalm 73, he was read from the conclusion of Psalm 73. The beginning of Psalm 73 was Asaph, the choir director for the worship in the temple, looking around at all the ungodly people seeming to be fat and happy and succeeding, and he's in a spiritual free fall. And he goes right down to the bottom, and we'll get there with this one here. This is how he, this is right in the middle of Psalm 73. This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. 
Now, I've talked with people in this church that, that have that talked to me just like they read Psalm 73, and they're trying to put it in their own words. Pastor, I feel like I'm doing all the right things. I feel like I'm doing these things, and it still feels my, my, my life is falling apart. And Asaph hits the bottom, goes into the Lord to, have, to work out these difficulties, and then comes out the other side. Wisdom tells us how to deal with those dark moments, how to face them, where hope is found, the direction of God in those moments. All right, so the book of Proverbs. Let's just say a couple things quickly about the book of Proverbs uh, that we're going to dig into as one of those books within the wisdom literature, okay? Now, I don't know if you thought about this. Proverbs sometimes are confusing. Uh, Proverbs are like popcorn. I don't know if you ever thought about that, right? They are tight little kernels that seem to be difficult to crack. But if you put some heat on them, right, like popcorn kernels, you understand what you're doing to interpret them. That's that big word, hermeneutics. That's all it means to interpret them. If you understand what you're to do when you interpret them, there's a depth of wisdom there to be found. Okay? Now, one of the goals that we have is we want you to read the book of Proverbs as we work through the series. We're going to be gathering collections of Proverbs on particular topics. And one of our goals is to teach you how to study the book of Proverbs itself, right? Because we want it to become a source of wisdom for you. Uh, we want to give you some verses that are really great ones to memorize as you work your way through the book of Proverbs. The goal here is not just for us to get everything that we can as pastors from the book of Proverbs, but to set you off on a path of wisdom yourself so that you can access it and make use of the book of Proverbs and appropriate it legitimately to guide and direct your own choices, and, and, and that not only to help you find the path of life, but help you to lead other people on the path of life. One of the reasons why we gather together, I know uh, Pastor Will uh, in his faith and finances class, right? Those of you that attended there, my wife has been, has been a part of that. Uh, one, of the, one of the things you have to you're, you're ask every week is, who did you talk to this week who had some wisdom? Right? Who did you talk to that could could grab you and pull you out of your life and attach you to God's will and ways. Who did you have that? Well, you need to be a person who's regularly drawing from that resource yourself for God's blessing. So we want to unpack those, okay? So here's what the book of Proverbs says that it, it's supposed to accomplish in us when we read it. If you look back at chapter 1, verse 2, this is the purpose of the whole book. And this is what he wants to do in us. And it's going to take some work. He wants us to know wisdom. What is a wise way to live? And one, two, here's what he says. For gaining wisdom and instruction, right? This is not something that has to do with IQ. It doesn't have to do with years. It just has to do with paying attention to and applying the truth of God to your life. Thinking in his terms, right? This is not something you wait until you're like me and you don't have any hair on your head and you've got gray stuff coming around your face. You don't need that to have wisdom. The wisdom is God has given here. You need to apply yourself to it. So to know wisdom and to understand wisdom sayings for understanding words of insight. Right? So these Proverbs are given to us to dig into these little kernels and to put some pressure on until they pop open and we get the, the kernel of truth that God wants us to give and bring it to bear on our lives. And then he continues, for receiving instruction and prudent behavior to subscribe to moral insight, okay? Well, there, there, Proverbs is, is going to go through all the ambiguities of life. Think about the ambiguities of life and how important it is. Think about how important it is at certain times to keep your mouth shut. Wisdom is shown up in the person who shuts their mouth. And people go, that's a wise person. This way. Sometimes, right, one of the favorite ones that I read in the King James when I was younger, and I could, didn't get it, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. And when I was young, I thought, I don't know what in the world they're talking about, right? But talking about a word, right, when have you had somebody say something that you was the exact word that you needed to hear from God? Oh, I needed to be reminded that I'd forgotten about the fact that God's ruling and reigning. I have vested all my hopes in this political leader. I needed to be reminded today that God loves me. I needed to be reminded of that today because I've just screwed up today and I just I feel like I'm just a basket case, useless. I need to be taken back to the cross of Jesus. 
a word fitly spoken. I've had, I've had moments in my life, and all of us have, we've had words unfitly spoken. I, I, how powerful a word can be when it's spoken in anger and wrong. I had a, had a moment that happened to me when I was a basketball player in, in sophomore year. I could almost replay it for you word for word because I was chewed out by an angry coach in the front of about a 1,000 fans. And I just wanted to crawl off of the court under the bleachers. Well, he came back and apologized to me later, but all the hair was burnt off of my face and head. And, and inside of me, I thought I was a loser. Next time I picked up the basketball, I, I was afraid to move with it. Right? Now, there's different things, right? Whether or not I responded wrongly or he said wrongly, that there's a question here. But a word fitly spoken can raise somebody up from despair. It can stop somebody from doing something really stupid. It can make them say no to suicide. The power of words, right, to do that. Okay? Many of us can sit here and recall words that our parents or people important to our lives have said to us have become like scars that are in our souls. Some of them from brothers and sisters in Christ, the power of your words. The, the book of Proverbs is going to talk a lot about being wise with your mouth. Being wise with your mouth. So moral insight, when to open your mouth, when to shut it, and what to say when you open it. Those are, those are wisdom. And then finally, for giving prudence to, the, to those who are simple and knowledge and discretion to the young, right? To move you toward maturity. And this is the thing. You can be old and a fool. You can be young and wise. If you continue to trust yourself and listen to everybody else but God and his wisdom, you can grow old and just become a confirmed fool. But at any moment in your life, you can decide to listen to somebody different. Right? God's wisdom is available to us. The question is, are we going to lean in to listen to it? So the key question here, right, when it comes to the Proverbs, are you ready and willing to be taught? Right? So the question is, as we go across this, you know where the Proverbs that are going to be the hardest? Well, here's two things that we're going to confront. One, you're going to need some patience to keep heeding the kernels until they pop. Right? Here's a wrong way to read the book of Proverbs. Okay, now this is this kind of Christian lore. So some of you have been around. I had people say to me earlier on, here's a good thing to do. Read five chapters of Psalms a day and one chapter of Proverbs a day, and you'll read through the whole book of Psalms and Proverbs every month. Okay, well, that's okay. You will do that. And if you're not reading anything, that's a good thing to do. But the book of Proverbs is not meant to be read by absorbing. It's meant to be taking these, these individual Proverbs and sitting on them until you understand what they're saying. And the book of Psalms is a book of poetry, which by its very design is meant to slow you down and try to figure out what's going on. I would rather have you just read one Psalm and hang around in it until you understand it for a couple weeks. And for Proverbs, we're going to gather Proverbs all on the same topic as they're sprinkled out throughout Proverbs. We're going to gather topics on friendship, on contentment, on finances, on parenting. Those are some of the topics we're going to talk about, and we're going to try to draw out the, the teaching from these Proverbs and unpack these little kernels and also teach us how to do that on our own. Okay? And if you're, a, if you're someone who has children in your home, or you're a friend of people who have children, or you're a grandparent, or a great-grandparent, or you're an aunt and uncle, or you're an aunt and uncle just because they call you an aunt and uncle, right, or whatever it is, you should be invested wisely in the lives of your kids. Okay? Matter of fact, you shouldn't be the cool aunt or uncle that comes over that the parents have to undo all of your influence after you leave. Right? You shouldn't be that kind of person. You shouldn't be the idiot. Oh, no, I love them. They're so vibrant and everything, but we've got to deprogram the kids once they're gone. Okay? So those are the kind of things that, that we want to get after here. And so notice the call is listen. And the whole, the whole idea of Proverbs is an older, wise person is communicating it to someone that they're mentoring. It envisions a father to a son or a mother to a son and trying to pass on wisdom. 
truths that go beyond every generation because they're just true of life in the world that God created. They don't grow old because things don't change. Okay? One of the most famous wisdom books, right, is there's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes. Okay? So there's truths that they, they go over. You don't progress beyond these truths because you don't get to escape the world that God created. So he's going to say, lean in, listen to your fathers. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Okay? There's three people that the book of Proverbs wants to go after, and I end with this just to challenge you. There's the gullible. The gullible are the ones that are not committed to any kind of vision of life or to live it out. But they're just gullible, and they're just ripe for being exploited by somebody who's committed to sin or committed, hopefully, to good. The gullible person is a person, though, that's not curious. They're not curious about life. They're just kind of living it, kind of being in the moment, if you will. And the proverb says, hey, gullible person, naive person, do you want to be taught? Do you have any curiosity about figuring out what life is really about? Well, come, follow me. The other one is the fool. The fool is the person who just doesn't care. Whatever. Right? Live and let live. I don't think there is any good ways to live, any bad ways necessarily. It's just what people want. But the fool, of course, in the book of wisdom is said in his heart, there is no God. And so I don't need to have a God direct my life. I don't need to have a God tell me who I am or how I am to live or how I am to relate to my neighbors. I'll figure that out on my own. I'm a fool, but they'll let other people do what they want. The last one is what's often called the mocker, the cynic. They're the ones that are committed to a life of foolishness and to undermining the faith and trust of other people who are committed to following God. The cynic is the one hardest because they're committed to their foolishness. Now, all of us, to a certain degree, are gullible. We need to be taught. All of us are foolish in places where we should be wiser. And by God's grace, I hope that none of us are bent against God's will as a mocker. Now, what I guarantee is it's going to cause us some difficulty, some challenge to hang in there to learn, but even more so to obey. And remember, at the core of it, do you trust, do you believe that God knows what he's talking about? Do you trust, do you believe that God knows what he talks about? Do you believe that for your relationship with your partner? When God says this is what a man and a woman should look like in marriage, do you believe that that's wise and good? Do you trust that with your sexuality, what God says about it? Do you believe that that's wise and good? Do you trust that with your money? That that money doesn't belong to you and you're called to steward it. Matter of fact, that the best way that you're going to find freedom from it and for what God intended for it is to submit it to his purpose. Do you believe that? Are you willing to listen to God and let him poke into areas that you're perfectly fine with right now, even though they're leading you down a path of death and robbing you of the life that God wants you to have? So the question to us all as we begin is, will we listen? Will we listen? Bless you. All right. Pray with me, will you? As Grayson comes up to sing and uh, finish our time, let me pray with us. Lord, we're so grateful for your kindness to us, Lord. We thank you above all that you came after us, Lord. And we were stupid enough to think that we can make it on our own. Lord, that we could tell ourselves what was right and good for ourselves. That we, uh, Lord, knew better. Uh, God, forgive us for the arrogance, Lord, to think that the creator of heaven and earth, the one who rules and reigns, the one who will bring everything to the goal for which you've made it, Lord, that we would have the audacity to think that we know better. Lord, and today, Lord, in our own individual lives, there's areas in our lives where we just are unwilling to let you tell us what's good and true. Oh, God, we're struggling to forgive, even though you said that we need to be people who forgive our debts as we've been forgiven. 
Lord, we're people who go about living and we don't ask you for protection from the evil one, even though he, he tries to, to destroy and divide us. Lord, you said that the path of life is to meditate in your word day and night. And Lord, we don't give time to it. And Lord, we're fools. Lord, forgive us, Lord, we pray. Lord, help us over these next couple months, Lord, to learn together as your people. Lord, we want to come to a right understanding of you, to have the right view of you, to be in, in awe of you that would allow us to be teachable. Lord, deliver us, guide us. Lord, we need you as our shepherd to guide us through the wild. So we pray this in the name of Jesus.